talks to some people. Well, when 9-11 happened, um, and I don't want to go too far into this, except to say I have a gentleman who was the third highest ranking man at the Naval Research Labs, who prior to 9-11 in the Vice President's office, the Pres Vice President Cheney's, saw all the plans for 9-11 prior to it occurring. He's deceased, since I'm, I'm talking about it now, I did not talk about it for years. And he was told, you know, I used to stay at my home. He said, look, you know, I was told my wife and my children, my grandchildren would be killed along with me if I ever mentioned this. He took it to his grave, gave me the information. God bless him, Richard Foch, Rick Foch, who was a very high-ranking scientist, an aerospace uh, figure in the uh, Naval Research Labs, which is the biggest Department of Defense lab. So when 9-11 happened, which was about four or five months after the 2001 uh, disclosure event, where we had hundreds of thousands of people contacting Congress to hold hearings on this issue, which of course when 9-11 happened, that fell way to the back burner very quickly. And uh, they then said, well, we gotta go get those guys in Afghanistan. Then they did something else, another false flag. They concocted false intelligence, yellow cake, remember the story, the story of yellow cake, uranium, out of Africa, they made up all these stories. And they put poor Colin Powell up before the UN holding a vial of anthrax and other biological and chemical weapons saying that uh, Saddam Hussein in Iraq had these. He did not. And he was put up there thinking that he was being provided accurate intelligence when he was not. And there are people on the inside who have come forward saying that they knew that that intelligence was wrong or very likely wrong. But based on that, we went into Iraq, where we are still embroiled, blew up that whole area of the world. Now we have ISIS. And this was all planned and known with malice aforethought. So we don't have to reach back thousands of years of with Trojan horses and machinations of Machiavellian uh, psychopaths who have been militarist over the, in the course of human history. We only need gaze back from Vietnam to today to see the extent to which these false flag operations hoaxed events, exaggerated threats can stampede a populace and the Congress and the presidency into very dangerous and bad decisions. Probably you all know about the Iraq war and how we, through the Vice President Cheney's office, cherry-picked intelligence so that Colin Powell, the Secretary of State, would go to the UN and talk about the fearsome weapons of mass destruction that Saddam Hussein had. Now, you know, I'm no fan of Saddam Hussein, who's obviously a thug and a dictator, and they're all over the world. However, he did not have those weapons, and it was known he did not have them. However, it was enough to stampede the American people and the Congress into a disastrous war. And it was all based on knowingly false and hoaxed, in some cases, intelligence. Colin Powell, the Secretary of State, who had been chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, by the way, it isn't like he wasn't familiar with military and intelligence operations, admitted later that he was deceived. And his chief of staff went on the record saying that they were deceived by an intelligence operation out of the West Wing run by the Vice President uh, Cheney. Of course, that ship sailed a while back. I'll get into some things that happened there that will stun you. And with a uh, weapon uh, electronic systems on satellites. But flashback to September 11, 2001. The world is in shock. The American people are paralyzed with fear and grief. Over the next few days, an unprecedented show of solidarity and patriotism. Americans fly their flag from every car and hang them outside their homes. They unify around an overwhelmed president, brought together as one by terror and loss. Few raised an eyebrow as constitutionally protected freedoms disappeared 
and the war drum beat loud and unopposed. The 9-11 attack set the stage for an invasion agenda that had been pre-planned for years, as General Wesley Clark revealed in a 2007 interview. He said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're gonna take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. I said, is it classified? He said, yes, sir. I said, <laughs> I said, well, don't show it to me. When Von Braun talked to me about this faked extraterrestrial, he called it a faked alien invasion that was being planned. I saw on a board a list of countries against whom we were going to build space-based weapons. I called Wesley Clark and he answered the phone. And I said, well, you know, what is it about? And he said, well, I asked that question. What is it about? And the guy at the desk said, I don't know. I said, we're going to war with Iraq. Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> in its paper, published in 2000, Rebuilding America's Defenses, the neoconservative think tank project for the new American century asserted that only a, quote, new Pearl Harbor would generate the political will for the military and defense policy transformations the group desired. Indeed, these traumatizing events are always planned or hijacked in order to manipulate perception and manufacture consent for military action and the theft of our wealth and liberty. George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, and others had decided to go, go to war with Iraq long before Colin Powell gave that presentation. I feel like uh, it was the lowest point in my professional and personal life that I had a hand in managing it. Trouble. Let's not forget weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Well, where did that really come from? George Tenet. And what did he say? Oh, that intelligence is a slam dunk. Well, did we ever find any weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? No. So we sent all those people in there, we spent all that money, all those American lives, over 4,000 uh, soldiers, American soldiers died in that war, untold Iraqi civilians. For what? Because the CIA had a relationship with the oil companies. This is the nature of the government aspect, why we need to understand the deep state and go in deeper. Um, you know, you have the official story in the case of 9-11, you know, <laughs> these hijackers got on a plane with box cutters and took down an air defense system that had been set up to avoid nuclear war. Okay, that's the United States air defense system had been set up during the Cold War. That means you couldn't thwart it with some hijackers. It wasn't going to happen. So, but the official story is that some guy in a cave controlled these people to do that. All right. Um, and, and took down the biggest military in the entire world. So, and, and we know, in fact, uh, there's so many inconsistencies 20 years later around that story. It just doesn't hold up at all, the official story. The secondary story, a lot of professors, including Professor Peter Dale Scott, a lot of writers, researchers, um, credible people went into it and said, here's a lot of the things that actually happened, including a lot of weird stock movements in the background while all this was going on relating to airlines and Homeland Security style equipment because they created Homeland Security directly out of the 9-11 attacks. And it's relevant now to speak of 9-11 because Homeland Security is the ogre in the room that just keeps growing and growing. It's like Jabba the Hutt. And it's got a quarter of a million employees. It's getting fatter and fatter. Now it wants the disinformation board. You know, this thing just, they, they want to basically control the United States through the idea of protection and that you'll be safe. We will protect you. Um, so over and over again, we need to step back and take a look and say, well, how did we get into this? What is it exactly that took place here? And the Department of Homeland Security is a good place to start. Fundamentally, conversations like the one that we're having here is what they're trying to stop. And we have to remember that and keep that in mind. But we've come a long way since the 9-11 attacks. That same document that called for a new Pearl Harbor goes on to describe how we need to put weapons in space and even predicts the creation of the Space Force. For a complete fascist takeover, the men behind the curtain will have to play their final card, a cosmic 9-11. This temptation 
to generate a false flag attack on the part of some extraterrestrial civilization. You know, you, you even hear people like Ronald Reagan make reference to it. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Oh, uh, wouldn't it be clear if we all of a sudden found ourselves being attacked by a, a, an extraterrestrial civilization, we'd finally all come together. Wouldn't that be really lovely? Well, it's not really lovely for the industrial state. They don't want to lose their other enemies first. They want to use up all that before they go to that, that extreme. The last card was the most profound experience I had in my whole life. And I accepted the mission. And until Stephen Greer picked me up and talked me into going to the Disclosure Project, when I had just about given up, that's when I saw that there were other witnesses to what's going on, to the truth, to the facts. When she told me what Werner von Braun had said, it didn't surprise me because I had previously met with a number of people in the defense industry and in the intelligence community who had already told me that there was such a plan and that, that it could be actuated at any moment. And that that was one of the long-term agendas was keep the technologies away so we maintain our industrial base of fossil fuel and all this. When we're ready to pull the trigger on releasing this information, spin it in the direction that benefits the foxes guarding the hen house, the people holding these secrets. But it was interesting to hear that all the way back in the early 70s that he had been warning her about this. And we know that those systems were developed in the, in actually in the late 40s and 50s. Now, the mother load, the, the, the sort of the crown jewel of that kind of event is what has been planned assiduously since the 1950s. And that is a threat from outer space that is alien that would unite the world around a military junta, a militarism, that would put all of humanity together, but against one or more extraterrestrial races. Now that plan, which they came up with in the 1950s, has been very carefully rolled out. And as you know from uh, my friend uh, Carol Rosen, who was Werner von Braun, the man who invented uh, the, you know, the, the rocket for Adolf Hitler, the V-2 rocket, and who then was brought in under Operation Paperclip by the OSS into our intelligence community and into our aerospace program after World War II. She said that on his deathbed, he said, look, you know, first we would, well, they had this plan, there would be the Cold War, when we could have had peace with the Soviet Union. Then there would be nations of concern and global terrorism. This we put out prior to 9-11, by the way. Then they would pull out the big one, and that is the threat from outer space. And it's all a lie. And that's what he kept saying, it's all a lie. The ultimate dream of the dialectical war machine, the military industrial uh, complex, is to have this war with a potential extraterrestrial civilization. It's their dream of all times. You know, you can roll into place all the kind of uh, strictures of a national security state. You can spend literally trillions of dollars a year on massive military equipment, super high tech equipment, et cetera. And so that it's logical that they would use that as an excuse. And we do know from repeated examples of it that the utilization of a false flag operation to initiate a war goes on over and over and over again. Our human family does that. The nation states do that. Hitler has done it. They dress up troops looking like some other neutral country they want to invade and have their own troops dress up like them and pretend they've assaulted somebody and they rush in and attack that country. You know, it's gone on and on. The other part of it is the technology. So when people hear this uh, information, they are shocked that beginning in 1954, October, we didn't need surface roads. We had figured out zero point energy from studying not only what humans were developing from the era of Tesla and T. Townsend Brown, who was the genius who was doing things with high voltage systems and, and crystals with things levitating. Literally, that was going on in the late 20s. And it was reproduced in Germany before World War II in the late 20s in the Kolosky-Frost experiment. What you see is that 
that stream of covert research into high voltage, high frequency electromagnetic fields that would give you free energy and levitation joined with the reverse engineering of extraterrestrial vehicles in the mid 40s and after, after Roswell and perhaps even before Roswell. Add to that, that at the end of World War II, the OSS that became the CIA went to Germany and acquired a disc and also a bell-shaped object that Adolf Hitler was working on, which was his secret weapon, which this is 100% true, which was based on so-called anti-gravity and electromagnetic fields. Proper term is electromagnetic gravitic, so electromagnetic gravitic, EMG. So those were brought over uh, under Operation Paperclip. So all of these, all that secrecy from the World War II era on became more and more compartmentalized the more they had breakthroughs, including in October 54, gravity control was mastered. Now, a man who was at the Naval Research Labs, the biggest Department of Defense lab in the United States, personally told me that he was in the vault. And uh, his name's Rick Foch. He had been in the vault and seen the documentation that we had mastered gravity control in October 54. And also, before that, this free energy, zero-point energy. So that means that if that were to come out, it would be the end of oil, gas, coal, nuclear power, centralized utilities, road construction, surface roads, engines and ships, rockets, jets, all of it, all of it's obsolete. We would lift the burden that we have placed upon Gaia because we have overstayed our welcome in terms of the technological system we're using, which is really an 1800s paradigm of fossil fuels. Even atomic power, nuclear power, is from the mid-40s. So everything since the mid-40s is in a black box, and we're killing the planet, keeping it secret. And these days, the more I look at the technology that's been developed over the last 20, 30, 40 years, I look at the work of T. Townsend Brown, I look at the work of Poletnikov, I look at the work of these guys and, and the uh, ARV, the Alien Reproduction Vehicle, I see these things and I see how much evidence there is that they were produced and there's absolutely no reason we wouldn't have gone to the moon and established bases or gone to Mars and established bases. With their secret financing and high technology, it would seem that there's every bit of evidence to show that there is a secret space program. If this is so, then the follow-up question has to be, if they all have this technology hidden from us, is it possible that they're creating a parallel civilization to ours, a breakaway civilization? I think it's worth suggesting that if there is a secret space program, then clearly it has some sort of agenda. You know, we're not talking about just, I think, going back to the moon for the sake of it and picking up a few rocks and stones here and there. There has to be an agenda, and I think that agenda would be to sort of further travel out into the solar system and beyond. Maybe they've even gone beyond, you know, the solar system itself. If that's the case, then we could be looking at an entire elite, if you like, on the planet which has access to technology way beyond the rest of us, maybe technology to travel who knows where, and essentially they don't see themselves as just members of the human race like the rest of us. They see themselves as an elite which has the ability to, in the future, and maybe even now, do things that the rest of us will never do. And that creates sort of a, like a hierarchy that operates outside of the regular confines of civilization. And that would be kind of profound and disturbing as well, the idea that somebody is, is running a program and that the rest of us are completely left out of the loop of. Let's go back to the Cold War and the space race. The Russians got their Nazi scientists, uh, but they were focusing on heavy lift rockets. They could put big, heavy payloads up into space. That's why the Russians uh, beat us to the first Sputnik, okay, the first satellite, Laika, the first dog in space, the first woman in space, first man to orbit the Earth, and, and we were starting to feel the pain. Wait a minute, we, you know, what are we doing? Well, what we were doing was building uh, miniaturized, computerized type equipment for trajectory and for all the scientific things needed for space travel. 
Okay? Now, what was happening is, and what nobody really knows and has not been plainly told to people, is that these Nazi scientists were in touch with each other. For example, most of the Nazi scientists early on working on the space program were headquartered down at uh, El Paso. They got weekend passes. Nobody kept tabs with them. They didn't have guards going with them. They'd go right into Mexico. They'd send telephone messages and letters to their counterparts in Russia. And at the very top, at the very top of the food chain, at the level of the international bankers, at the level of the John J. McCloy, who was the High Commissioner of Germany, but then also had been the largest lender of money through Citibank uh, to the Hitler and the Nazis, at that level, they put the two space programs together. They put the heavy lift rockets with the computerization. And then so all of these years when we've been paying our tax money and watching these big rockets lift off from Cape Carnaveral, you know, it's really quite impressive. Hey, over here, you know, they had uh, anti-gravity and they had very sophisticated stuff. And that was the beginning of a breakaway civilization. When it comes to the idea of a secret space program, there's, there's one issue which I think is very important. It doesn't necessarily relate to specifics, but if you think about it, we first landed on the moon, in terms of a manned mission at least, in July 1969. Now, if you look at the way in which every aspect of technology has advanced since then, computers, you know, that were once the size of almost like a car, you know, they're now like a matchbox. You know, the internet, medical technology, Everything has advanced to incredible degrees, but we're expected to believe that the same brute force rocketry that sent people to, to the moon in 1969 is still the only way to get people into space today. And to me, that is totally illogical when every other single aspect of technology has literally gone through the roof in terms of you know, developments. Why is it then we're still, we're still relying upon rockets, brute force engines, and technology that actually really isn't advanced. You know, the Saturn rocket wasn't advanced as such, it was just huge. And it's kind of the same situation today. And I find that very suspicious that we're still supposedly using rocket technology when every other technology has advanced. For that reason, I do think there probably is some sort of covert space program going on. And this gets into Gary McKinnon, uh, the fellow who was just a, a hacker, and he hacked into the Pentagon computers, basically looking to see if he could find for any proof on UFOs. And what he found was uh, rosters and uh, tables of organization for the space fleet and uh, the ships we have uh, that are being made in secrecy, the, again, the blending of the, of the space programs, and uh, officers, named all the officers even though the Pentagon themselves admit that he didn't do any harm <laughs> to the Pentagon computers or, or to national security, but he's just telling tales out of school and they don't like it. The United States government eventually dropped its case against Gary McKinnon. Perhaps the information was so sensitive they didn't want to risk going to trial. It is clear that someone is hiding very advanced technologies from the rest of humanity. It is also possible that these super technologies are being used by the elite to not only get off planet, but also to create a separate society from ours, a breakaway civilization, if you will. According to some estimates, we cannot track $2.3 trillion in transactions. On September 10th, 2001, the day before 9-11, then Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld testified in front of congressmen about $2.3 trillion missing from the Pentagon. In 2015, an Inspector General report came out detailing that that number grew from $2.3 trillion to $6.5 trillion missing from the Pentagon. This money is going into unacknowledged projects both above our heads and below ground, into deep underground military bases and secret space programs with technology far beyond what many of us could even realize. Our black budget, for instance, garners $1.023 trillion every two years. It's over $500 billion a year. Right now, there are 131 active deep underground military bases in the United States. There's 1,477 of them worldwide. 
Each one has an average cost of 17 to 19 billion dollars. Each one is uh, built in the site, uh, oh, it used to be, it'd take a year to two years to build each one. And now they're capable of building a couple of them a year uh, with sophisticated methods. Area 51 is only one base, one of the 131 bases. Of these 131 bases, I call Area 51 a mega base. It's got more than one base in it. It's Tonopah Test Range, Area 51, S2, S4, Groom Lake, and a host of others. Now, these mega bases are gobbling up our gross national product. Right now, we're spending 28% of the gross national product on building underground bases solely. China has built 50 different ghost cities that collectively are built to hold an estimated 64 million inhabitants. The department buildings, the roads, all of the infrastructure, all the plumbing, all the electrical, everything you need for a city, and there's nobody there. 50 cities, 64 million people. Now remember, China's gross domestic product is $11.2 trillion. They're not even spending a majority of their gross domestic product on these ghost cities, and yet they have the money to do it. It's only cost them a few trillion dollars. So once you start thinking about it that way, you start to see how much money a thousand billion dollars really is. A billion dollars is a lot. If you're a billionaire, you can do anything you want. A thousand billion dollars is a sum of money that just gets dropped out there with this word trillion, but we're not really thinking about how it literally can build an entire civilization. The articles on China's ghost cities refer to it as China's multi-billion dollar debt, not a debt in the trillions. In fact, in 2016, one estimate that I saw showed that the total estimated debt that China has gone into to build these ghost cities is only $2.5 trillion. Now that's 50 different cities that hold 64 million people, just because they think that as they continue to have a population boom, that they need to have a place where these people can eventually go. But literally nobody is there right now. So imagine what that means when you start tossing around a figure of the two big to fail banks needing a bailout that according to Senator Ron Paul was $29 trillion. You're talking about over 10 times the amount of money that China needed to build 50 different ghost cities that can hold millions and millions and millions of people. So then the question is, where did all this money go? The total amount of money in the world in the 2008 year of the collapse, the gross world product or GWP, was only $60 trillion. So the theft of 29 trillion from the printed out of hot air US dollar is half of the wealth of the entire world. Try to wrap your head around this because what I'm telling you is, from all the insiders I've been speaking to for the last 20 years, they are building civilizations. It's just not above ground where we see it on the surface of the planet. There is vast amounts of underground drilling. There are huge caverns 20, 30 miles wide that they've built out into gorgeous, elaborate cities and they're building entire civilizations on planets and moons in our solar system. This is where the money is going. Well, I have a copy of the Inspector General Act here in front of me, and it says, among other things, that it's your responsibility to conduct and supervise audits and investigations relating to the programs and operations of your agency. That's correct. So I'm asking you if your agency has, in fact, according to Bloomberg, extended $9 trillion in credit, which, by the way, works out to $30,000 for every single man, woman, and child in this country, I'd like to know, if you're not responsible for investigating that, who is? At this point, we're at the very, we're conducting our lending facility project at a fairly high level and have not gotten to a specific level of detail to really be in a position to respond to your question. Have you conducted any investigation or auditing of the losses that the Federal Reserve has experienced on its lending since last September? We're still in the process of conducting that review until we actually you know, go out and 
and gather the information, I'm not in a position to really respond to, to the specific question. So are you telling me that nobody at the Federal Reserve is keeping track on a regular basis of the losses that it incurs on what is now a $2 trillion portfolio? Until we actually look at the program and have the information, we are not in a position to say whether there are losses or to respond in any other way to that. Mr. Chairman, my, my time is up, but I have to tell you honestly, I am shocked to find out that nobody at the Federal Reserve, including the Inspector General, is keeping track of this. What's amazing is that right now we're seeing the very first audit of the Pentagon ever. And this audit could very well begin to expose the trillions and trillions, upwards of even 21 trillion, if not more money than that, begin to be exposed. And we might even find out very soon where the, all this money actually went. Let's go back now to the LIBOR scandal that happened in the wake of the 2008 economic collapse. LIBOR is an acronym that stands for London Interbank Offered Rate. And what we're finding is that these two big to fail banks are only appearing to be in competition with each other. The LIBOR scandal revealed that these guys are calling each other on the phone, colluding about how to rig their own interest rates so that one appears to be winning, one appears to be losing, but they're actually like branch offices of a single larger corporation. All of the apparent competition, oh, these guys' stock is going down. Oh, it's a bloodbath. No, 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 no. They're doing all this together. They're competing only on paper when in fact it's collusion. This is financial organized crime on such a massive scale how can you arrest all the banks? They're too big to fail. This gets into a law that was passed in the United States in 1970 called the RICO Act, which stands for Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations. And that act was built to be able to take down massively organized crime. None of this really makes sense until you get back into the idea of the Federal Reserve System. Now, up until the Federal Reserve was founded in 1913, the United States essentially was in control of its own currency. This same banking cartel that we've been talking about worked behind the scenes to create a series of fake economic crises in the late 1800s and early 1900s, which caused regular Americans to have their savings wiped out. This became such a crisis that people were desperately calling for reform. And then the government comes along and says, look, we're bribed corrupt politicians. We don't really know what we're doing. They have spokespeople saying these kinds of things in the media. Let's bring in the investors. Let's bring in the British bankers, the people who really know how to make money. They've been doing it for a long time. They're not just gonna hold an office for a few years and go disappear. They are the guys who really understand how to run a financial system. So what did we do? We handed over the issuance of American currency to a private corporation of private bankers. When you see Federal Reserve note on the US dollar, that means it's printed by the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve, since they came into power just over a century ago, has eroded the purchasing power of the US dollar by 99%. So what was really going on there? Do you think that these investors built up the equity of the United States, made us more profitable? It's exactly the opposite. We have been living in a prolonged economic depression. They just don't call it that because the metrics that we use to measure the economy are coming from a rigged system, just like we saw with LIBOR. Don't bother to look at the Dow Jones. Don't bother to look at the NASDAQ. That has nothing to do with the reality of everyone else and how hard it has become to earn a living. The complete wiping out of the middle class. You have rich and you have poor. And even among the rich, you then have super rich people where a concentrated small cluster of individuals have so much wealth that it could feed entire nations, entire peoples. So this is something that is an economic inequality that must be addressed. And the only way that we're ever really going to learn this is by a collective, massive understanding. I say the elite powers in control, which is nothing, which is really the same as these uh, central banking dynasties that are 
basically sitting o on, over the nations. They are a form of global government, except that they are not government at all. They're just dominance. They are dominance. They are the ones that issue the orders to all the nations. Uh, as we saw clearly in 1947, after Roswell, we saw these elite powers in control issue these orders to all the nations that anything real that comes up in, in regards to alien visitors or UFOs must immediately be covered up at all costs, no matter what. And that was the first, uh, that was how that wall, uh, embargo of truth, that Berlin Wall went up originally in 1947. And that's an example of them in action over the nations. And that's the reason why, <laughs> why disclosure and the images that conjures up in our minds is not a real thing, really. Because the nations, whether you're talking about the United States or any place else, they don't have the actual agenda of aliens to reveal. They don't, they're not on the inside of that. They really aren't. The nations just follow orders. That's all they do. And that's what they're doing now, and that's what they always do. And when you see them all doing something strange or something that seems out of the ordinary, uh, it's because they're following the orders of the elite powers in control. We're looking at. So let's look at some of the bills that they're using to thwart the system of democracy. Um, and of course, we've heard a lot about the disinformation czar, uh, and, and she is quite a panic. I'm going to try not to focus on her so, so much, but boy, what a character. Um, so Homeland Security itself, this is how they're portraying this. Let's start with this. Department of Homeland Security internal working group protects free speech and other fundamental rights when addressing disinformation that threatens the security of the United States. I'm surprised they didn't say homeland. They, they don't like to say United States. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security is charged with safeguarding the United States. Hold on. That's the military's job under the Constitution, provide for the common defense. It's not really. The Department of Homeland Security, you know, is extra constitutional in this sense. But anyway. Uh, against threats to its security, including threats exacerbated by disinformation. What they call disinformation is anything that's against the regime. And this is the nature of the problem. And there's a certain regime in there that, uh, you know, needs this kind of cover. And they've thrown out a lot of loyalists and taken on a lot of people during this two decades of power. And, um, now the people that are embedded in there, a lot of them are Obama people, in fact, and they're all loyal to Stepford Biden for now, <laughs> uh, while his cognitive decline you know, doesn't completely take him out. So we're looking there um, at what they're trying to introduce with the Department of Homeland Security with this new disinformation governance board. And they're claiming that it's related it, believe it or not, they, in here they say, well, you know, Hurricane Sandy, for example, that would have been affected by disinformation. You know, they're trying to make these connections where there are none. So if they don't like, for example, the way that I talk about the UFO file <laughs> and the phony CIA threat around the UFOs, um, then that's disinformation and it's dangerous. It's just as dangerous as, you know, Ukraine-Russia war propaganda. Um, so in fact, the country is based and, you know, has it, ensconced in the constitution, free speech, it's right there. It's the first amendment. It's the number one most important thing. So um, this, the founders understood and discovered, and uh, they realized that without free speech, you don't get anywhere. That's how the king locked people down. So by creating this system, they created this great leveling where the average person would have the ability to influence the government and could tell his fellow citizens what was going on. Now, what we're looking at, they need to get rid of that mechanism. And uh, we've seen them squelch stories that were important, of course, in the last election, the Hunter Biden laptop story. Now that's come out. And this has been, you know, absolutely crucial data was left on the cutting room floor because Twitter and Facebook blocked it. And um, so we got into a real crisis there of the Constitution. That was a real red line when uh, they prevented the New York Post from publishing the story on these platforms. We didn't take the message then, and now we're stuck with this situation. And now it is kind of a fight uh, on a level that you know can be very dramatic because these people are desperate. I believe that in their psychosis, they thought with the COVID op and the Ukraine war, they just you know take over, and I think that's what's in the back of their <laughs> minds. But the problem is that um, 
all of them have sworn an oath to the Constitution. And every aspect of government, from judges to presidents to senators to Congress people, swear an oath to that Constitution. So they have to change the meaning of free speech in these documents. That's what they're going to try to do. Let's look at uh, some of the articles covering this, because even the people that are on their side are shocked and dismayed at the arrogance of the push to just take away the ability for free speech so openly. Um, this one, Biden establishes a ministry of truth. This is out of the Wall Street Journal. The disinformation governance board already looks like a partisan instrument. Yeah, it's a lot worse than that, <laughs> but that's a good start. Department of Homeland Security has announced the formation of the disinformation governance board charged according to Politico, with countering misinformation related to Homeland Security. See how this is how we can bring in Homeland Security. Quarter of a million people doing illegal actions, doing surveillance on average citizens, moms who are complaining to teachers that they don't want their kids taught certain things. They're showing up on domestic terrorist lists. Uh, this is how far these people are going. And if they're not stopped, they're going to get down to basic levels like, you know, having people in the grocery store spy on you. Believe it or not, there's a plan for that. I mean, as absurd as it sounds, it's true. <laughs> um, Department of Homeland Security has announced the formation of the Disinformation Governance Board, charged, according to Politico, with countering misinformation related to Homeland Security, focused specifically on irregular migration and Russia. These are weird uh, tricks. They need, in order to pull in the Department of Homeland Security. They need immigration to somehow be related to it. The next piece they need is, oh, Russia disinformation. That way they can say, oh, we're protecting the homeland by shutting you, the average American citizen, up when you disagree with the policy of the Biden regime. All right, next up. Um, <laughs> in a twist too implausible for fiction, the abbreviation is DGB, one letter off from KGB. <laughs> Excellent point. The stated goal of combating mis- and disinformation is framed to seem unobjectionable. Who objects to truth and pines for falsehood? The DGB experts will guide the way, separating the informational wheat from the disinformational chaff, but there's one small problem with empowering truth experts. Experts are people. Yeah, and in this case, fascist people. People respond to incentives. Therefore, experts respond to incentives. And so on they go in here. There's a couple of really good points in here. The dangers of the DGB will be amplified if it becomes a tool of partisan political actors, and it already has. Executive Director Nina Jankowitz, who you know is showing up as the bimbo of the century. But you know, I think in a way they want that in a, in a strange way, because then she can be the face of it. Ha ha, you know, musical theater, uh, scary poppins and all these kinds of things. And it's true. She is bar bizarre individual, but the thing in her background that fascinates me the most is that she was an aide and an advisor to the Ukrainian government. Everywhere we go around major moves right now, we're seeing the Ukraine involved. What is the meaning of that? And how ensconced was the Biden political family with Ukraine, that every major move seems to be their power base is coming out of Ukraine. That is very disturbing, as is the loose nuclear talk and the lack of a peace process from this government. They're not interested in a peace process, and that's a really big problem. Every single time you get into war situations, there's a massive peace process, process involved. And, um, you know, look at the Palestinian war. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we've paid governments off before. Uh, let's think of Egypt, you know. Okay, we'll give you $5 billion. Just stop getting into it with Israel, okay? So Jimmy Carter goes over there, everybody shakes hands, and that's that. And we continue to just dole out money to both sides. All right, for some reason, you know, bankrolling that situation for peace, that's one way to spend your money. This is a little bit different. And uh, But there's always a peace process involved, you know. Uh, the Palestinian-Israeli thing, as long as that's gone on, there's still a process. With this war, they have incentives to keep it going, and they want the emergency powers won. They want to weaken Russia. This is their new policy through Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. So these are all very disturbing factors just lingering in the background <laughs> as we're doing this. And then you're looking here at the disinformation czar, and you're looking at this new office, which is supposed to crack down on dissent in the United States, and you wonder to yourself, What's going on with this? These are the same people 
who created this idea, you know, that the extremists and the Al Qaeda, you know, will put them on Gitmo and all that kind of thing. But now the citizens of the United States are supposed to be stripped of those rights. And so that we can be kind of put in our own little personal Gitmos and uh, the digital concentration camp and things of this nature. So now the domestic terror bill takes its aim, you know, uh, kind of directly from taking its cue from the 9-11 domestic terror acts. And, um, you know, so now they're changing the Arab terrorist extremist into the citizen of the United States. Now a United States citizen, boom, forget it. You are Al-Qaeda. And, um, you know, so that gives them the ability to do all these illegal searches that I referred to earlier. This is really... Um, you know, those people that were engaged in those ser- searches have to be prosecuted. The Senate Intelligence Committee needs to stop all the work that they're doing, including the phony UAP threat uh, briefings and all that, and say, who are those people that were facilitating those types of illegal searches of United States citizens? And that's what needs to be prosecuted and move forward. And then when you do that, you're going to reveal the house of cards that's trying to push this domestic terror bill. So it's actually a race between can people get the knowledge uh, in time around who's been going into their private data from the CDC and from the FBI, and can we prosecute those people before the domestic terrorism thing gets thrown into law because you have the Democrats running it, and the Democrats have gone completely insane. Now, I like to be independent on this program from Democrat or Republican. and, you know, there's, there's a lot of room in between, but those parties are dominated um, by warlike factions. But the DNC is just becoming so close to the CCP and has such an influence of China that I consider them uh, an enemy of the United States at this point. Um, this story just hit. CDC tracked millions of phones to see if Americans followed COVID lockdown orders. Totally illegal action. Newly released documents showed the CDC planned to use phone location data to monitor schools and churches and want to use the data for many non-COVID-19 purposes too. In other words, we have the cover of the COVID op, we get all the data, and then we use it for something else to track you for other purposes. For example, to put you on a domestic terrorism hit list. So that story is being widely uh, covered now in the media. There's just no way of getting around it. Right on its heels... The FBI conducted millions of warrantless searches of Americans' data in 2021. So the CDC, one government agency overreach, number two, the FBI. There's another one. So what's going on here? These are all illegal, unconstitutional searches of our information, and yet no heads are rolling. Nobody's being arrested. There's no cases for it. There's not even a hearing about this. Uh, This is pretty major action. And now we have to wonder, and here's where we're going to get into it, what is it exactly that they're looking for in this data? Um, I think a lot of it comes down to who is going to give them a problem, because what we're seeing uh, across the board with the deep state takeover of these different countries is they're using people who have very low popularity. (laughs) Just look at Stepford Biden, for example. He's 29% in the polls that favor him. Okay, those are Democratic polls. And um, Justin Trudeau, you know, somewhere around 22%. These people with those types of majorities can't really rule. They can't govern. It's impossible if you have 20% of the vote to be able to do that. So they're going to need to rely on emergency powers, and they get most of that through the continuity of government action of September 11th. The September 11th action uh, for emergency, which we're still under that emergency, is as hard as that is to believe, we're still cooked completely in that exact same situation. Even though we've gotten Republican presidents through their Democratic presidents, you've had Obama, everyone said, hey, Obama's going to get rid of that for sure. No, no, he doubled down on it. And every year when they signed the NDAA, which is the National Defense Authorization Act, boom, there we get all that money again, $800 billion. As long as you have that emergency signature attached, you're going to get that money. And that's the way it goes, whether it's Trump, Obama, or Bush, or step for Biden. So um, they're all on board with that. And you have to ask why? Well, because when government gets that kind of ruling authority, they don't like to give it up. So now all of these bills for domestic terrorism that we're seeing that are being pushed so heavily by the government and the Biden administration are all coming out of the Department of Homeland Security. 
Well, the Department of Homeland Security went from 10,000 employees to 250,000 today. That's a quarter of a million people. Think about it. First of all, that's an extra constitutional agency as well, uh, right off the bat. And not to mention the fact that the Department of Homeland Security, their original designation was to prevent terrorists from entering the country and protect the homeland. <laughs> uh, and a lot of the idea was to change America from the United States to the homeland and then assign it a different constitution and uh, use a number of different types of techniques, legal techniques to accomplish this. So we're finding ourselves right in the middle of that maelstrom. And here we are 20 years or so after the September 11th attacks, and these guys are ready. All the same rules that they rolled out to uh, prosecute extreme Muslims, Muslim terrorists and extremists, and um, all the unconstitutional uh, warrantless wiretapping and all that are now trying to be, they're trying to codify those into law as they distract us with this hysterical stuff on the side. The question is, are we going to go for that or are we going to call it out? And one of the ways we can call it out is by going after two central essential bills. And on top of that, uh, those are domestic surveillance bills. And I'm going to get into them right now. And then on top of that, the UFO threat aspect, which is what's coming on in the layer on top. And not a lot of people are talking about that one. Yes. Americans founded, okay, on free speech. And, you know, other countries follow our lead on that. But Americans in particular have a thing about it because it's in the Constitution. It's how the revolution started, in fact. So... Um, when you get down to that really core point and you're looking at it and you say, look, you know, free speech is fundamental. What is it these social media companies have tried to do? Twitter tried to deplatform everybody who was talking about, you know, uh, alternative medicine and who were talking about alternative political scenarios and all the rest. Get rid of this person, get rid of that person. Facebook does the same thing. Plus, they take all your data and they give it to the FBI and they give it to the CDC illegally. Those are illegal actions. Eventually, there's going to be some kind of class action lawsuit. Uh, so we're already seeing a lot of the stories that they've been laying out there. So it's a kind of a race. The idea is, can they get their system in place with a very small portion of the public? Again, I know that people think oh my God, everybody's gone crazy and all the rest. Actually, I believe that the, the numbers around 25% of support for this administration reflect more of what's going on there. Just like the Justin Trudeau, 22%. These are very small, small um, controlling numbers. And what they're trying to do is get a system in place so that they can't be touchable. And the way that you do that uh, as we've laid out so much on this program, is the continuity of government rules, especially in America, but the continuity of government rules can go global, as we've seen. Uh, they've talked about instituting continuity of government in Ukraine and in Canada. So <laughs> I'm, after we get through this Morrison thing, I'm going to give you something special on that. But let's do the Morrison thing, because I think it's significant in demonstrating how COG works and may answer that last question. Um, all right. So Scott Morrison was extremely unpopular during the lockdowns because of the fascist uh, abilities uh, that he exercised there in Australia. And uh, they had tremendous problems with him, kind of worse, I think, than any other country. You know, if you think even of like France and other places like that, they had their problems. But Morrison had just some of the most jackbooted um, lockdown policies that were beyond bizarre. But that was a real tryout for this new world order structure. Okay, but something happened. So he lost the election because of his unpopular policies, and but he still remained a member of parliament. Well, interestingly enough, recently some things came out about what he was doing as prime minister and watch how the emergency powers operate because it's very instructional. Secret powers of an Australian prime minister now revealed, this is New York Times, even they have to turn this guy in. Scott Morrison was busy during the pandemic. In addition to being prime minister, he covertly put himself in charge, covertly, remember, that's in secret, put himself in charge of five ministries. That's like saying, I'm defense secretary, I'm treasury secretary, I'm housing secretary, I'm secretary of state and president too, but I'm not telling you. Critics say he damaged democracy. Okay. Um, Let's go with this a little bit. 
Australian SLAM former leader for secretly taking five, count them five, cabinet jobs. So this is the consolidation of all those jobs into one person. So therefore, if I make a move and I say, well, I have this new COVID policy and I'm the new, I'm calling martial law, basically, there's nobody in the cabinet to disagree because I have all the jobs. And uh, that's exactly how it worked. This is the guy going off to have a cabinet meet. I kid you not. He's having a cabinet meeting with himself. <laughs> <laughs> so he's taking his meeting notes there. And he's like, I can't wait to be there to greet myself. It's like a Monty Python sketch. <laughs> it really is. Scott Morrison, Australian XPM, resists pressure to step down because he's still in parliament. He's still a, a member. Former Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison has resisted calls to resign from parliament after news emerged that he'd secretly assumed five additional roles during his tenure. And again, he did it in secret, so nobody knew. That's our friend Morrison. That's why Australia got so screwed up. Scott Morrison's ministerial grab holds lessons beyond Australia. You bet your life it does. These people can just do this in the background, sign a secret note covertly, and suddenly, voila. I have five different positions. Uh, can you imagine Stepford Biden being like, I'm defense secretary. All right. Uh, here's a little bit from that article on Morrison. That's not my job was uttered so often by Scott Morrison in his final months as Australia's prime minister that the phrase became a running joke. As it turns out, he had f far more jobs than voters Parliament, or indeed some of his own cabinet, realized while in power, Morrison quietly appointed himself to five other ministries during the pandemic, in some cases without the knowledge of the relevant ministers. In other words, I'm just doing this. It's got no oversight. Nobody else knows about it. I'm just assuming those jobs. This is how the emergency powers work, because if they were moving to consolidate and take that martial law step, it was up in the air. They were deciding on it but they needed those positions consolidated. And then he could step forward and do it. There'd be no opposition because he was doing all the jobs. Um, the revelations this week have ignited a firestorm, raising questions of accountability, transparency, and the concentration of power. They are questions not just for Morrison, but also for Australia and other democracies around the world. The pandemic provided the perfect fig leaf for strong men in more authoritarian systems to amass power. And they go after the, the Hungary guy because he threw George Soros out. But um, what we have there is a very clear-cut case. Okay, now let's jump to Canada. In Canada, they did the same thing. They called the emergency powers against the truckers during the trucker protests. And uh, remember, he's operating with under 30% popularity. But interestingly enough, he created a new cabinet position because she was the finance minister, Christia Freeland, who used to cozy up to all the Russian oligarchs in the 90s and the early 2000s. And uh, she was a journalist, actually. And here she shows up as this kind of totalitarian dictator along with Trudeau. Very odd indeed, except she's been working on George Soros's biography and working directly with Soros for a decade. So it explains a lot there. But here's what's interesting that they did. They created a new position, and the position was deputy prime minister. So here we have them again, uh, sort of, you know, giving her two jobs, just like Morrison is picking up jobs. And the idea is if I have enough phony positions, I can consolidate this thing. Now, this is the actual succession in the case that they lose the president. And it's the vice president, then it goes to the Speaker of the House, which is Nancy Pelosi, as we know, the president of the Senate. Uh, Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury, Defense, Attorney General, and online down it goes right down to the Secretary of Homeland Security. Now, however, continuity of government works entirely differently. And I want to really show how the Democrats at the end of the Trump administration were pushing the idea that Nancy Pelosi was going to become president as a result of this when they called continuity of government. That's not the way that it works. Uh, in continuity of government, the uh, line of succession goes directly to the NORTHCOM commander, and the NORTHCOM commander is the combatant commander of the United States. He takes over and runs martial law in America. That's the way that it would work. So if they called this emergency, that's what we would get, in fact, not Nancy Pelosi <laughs> or the, even the vice president at this point. Um, 
So let's go back. I want to prove this up because, um, you know, I get emails from time to time from people who say, I don't remember them trying to do continuity of government during Trump. And I can appreciate it because actually a lot of it was scrubbed from the internet. And when I went back to find some of it, I was shocked because many of the stories I had bookmarked weren't there anymore. But I had saved a number of them in any case. Uh, this is from October 4th, 2020, when Trump announced I have uh, COVID, right? And um, they were deciding at this point, can they utilize continuity of government to oust him and do that whole thing? Or should they go with this whole mail-in ballot thing. Secretly, this summer, the White House beefed up planning if Trump got COVID-19. A hospitalized president, a continuity crisis. There it is in October uh, of 2020. Let's go further still. Pelosi, continuity of government in place after Trump tests positive. Here she is. And again, the presumption here that she's working with is she's going to be president. That's not how continuity of government works. Uh, the idea of being, oh, if Trump and Pence were, you know, both got COVID, then she would take over. No, uh, actually, interestingly enough, the NORTHCOM commander would, General Van Herc. And that still is the case today if they press the button on continuity of government for any reason. And by the way, one of the things that they've included in that and talk about quite often is a cyber attack. Oh, the Russians are cyber attacking us. We need continuity of government. There's a lot of different reasons that they could call it out. And having a weak senile president in Stepford Biden the way we do now, it's kind of ideal for them to be looking at this. Um, but here's the rest of that article from Pelosi. Reuters, U.S. House of Representatives Speaker Nancy Pelosi said that plans for continuing the government should President Donald Trump become incapacitated remain in place. Pelosi said she'd been tested and would know the tests of her own results and blah, blah, blah. Um, and then in the article, it goes, the Democratic Speaker is next in the line of succession after Vice President Mike Pence. And it's very interesting. They're whole ignoring the NORTHCOM takeover guy. Now, in terms of these articles disappearing, I'm going to show this one because this article disappeared. It was from Yahoo. <laughs> and it says, an exhausted Trump's long path to coronavirus. Questions of government continuity arose in ways that haven't in years. Trump's diagnosis amounted to the most serious health threat to an American president. And this is the whole article there. Now, what's interesting is... You can try in 90 different ways to get the actual article, and you can't. But the leftover is there, that little vestige of what they were trying to do and the explanation of the article. When you go there, it'll just blow you into wide open random Yahoo-ness. And um, I've tried a number of different ways to get that original article, but this is what they were pushing. And there was a reason why they were doing this. Now, um, the continuity of government structure would place us under NORTHCOM, but it would also give us regional governors and the regions um, would be taken over by different military officials through NORTHCOM and they would divvy up resources and, and things of this nature. Now, I'm not saying this to scare us and to be like a fear porn thing. What I want to do is give us that clear outline of what they're talking about when they get to emergency powers. And I want to point out the commander for COG now. This is NORTHCOM commander. Of course, uh, he's a general doing the job for NORTHCOM like any other general. You know, I can't really say that one would be better than the other, but I can say that that structure they've been building for COG to take over for a long time. NORTHCOM commander working to advance defense. This is uh, from last week, and he's been doing a lot of press conferences, I've noticed. Uh, I've introduced... Uh, General Van Herc before, the person, um, the general who had the job before him, he was very public during COVID. And, you know, the NORTHCOM commanders, they reside deep in those bunkers and you never see them come out and give interviews. It just doesn't happen. His presence and Newsweek suddenly wanting to talk about COG, you couldn't talk about COG in open session in Congress. That's what it had been like. And you weren't allowed to mention it. And suddenly Newsweek was interested in saying, hey, COG, you know, this guy could take over. Uh, and you had a lot of things like this, exclusive inside the military's top secret plans if coronavirus cripples the government. Yeah, they were going to take over. 
they were thinking to themselves, well, we're going to have to oust Trump one way or another. Should we do it with this or just take the election? <laughs> it's one of the two. Um, and on Van Herc, again, the four-star general who will command the U.S. if government is crippled by coronavirus. Military puts plans in place for extraordinary circumstances and martial law. That's the Daily Mail in the U.K., they're talking about it openly so that, you know, if that happens, well, you heard about it in the Daily Mail, didn't you? Newsweek reports that U.S. military planners are looking at a range of radical hypotheticals around the coronavirus crisis. Should the country's top politicians be struck down by COVID-19 and civil government be incapacitated, martial law could be imposed. Uh, the combatant commander, the NORTHCOM commander, Van Herc, for the United States would leave the country if Washington were crippled. Let me say it again. The combatant commander, that's the NORTHCOM general, Van Herc, for the United States would lead the country if Washington were crippled or Stepford Biden stopped working. The scenario appears unlikely but there are also current debates about whether armed forces could be allowed to exercise emergency authority. The military could possibly serve as a policing function if widespread violence breaks out due to food shortages or financial chaos caused by the coronavirus. Uh, you know, they, whenever they float things, just like I've asked people to pay attention to the UFO threat meme that's out there in the media, when they, when they float these things around there, they're trial balloons. They're trying to see, how do people feel about this? Could we get away with it? Um, so the fact that they're talking about it in relation to Van Herc uh, taking over the country is pretty disturbing. 